as vegetation ecologist and work as a researcher in them, that department. Well, I was asked to talk about the importance of grazing animals for the biodiversity in the outfields. And uh, also I wanted to say some words about a few, a few climate arguments. So more in detail, I will talk about what is semi-natural grasslands. Why are semi-natural grasslands and alpine rangelands species rich? I will come to plant strategies and uh, ecological processes to explain that. And factors which influence on the effects of grazing. And at last, I will say something about carbon sequestration on alpine rangelands and the albedo effect. So, semi-natural grasslands. That is plant communities where a high proportion of the vegetation consists of a mixture of native grasses and dicotyledons herbs, uh, <laughs> uh, where woody shrubs are largely absent and where vegetation height is normally less than one meter. Uh, another uh, importance to say about semi-natural grasslands is that the species composition of these grasslands has not been substantially modified by intensive cultivation or the regular, regular use of fertilizers, manure and herbicides. They are managed systems which are used to provide winter feed as hay or grazing for domestic animal livestock. And uh, yes, these are two definitions I found. It's, uh, I guess it's uh, several uh, uh, definitions, but I think this is what we, we uh, understand about semi-natural grasslands in, in Norway. Well, um, some words about uh, the transhumans in Norway, uh, as Pablo was also talking about. We have this old traditional production system, alpine summer farming, and it's still practiced. Uh, almost every farm situated in the mountain regions had summer farms in 1850. Uh, they were often located in the transition between subalpine and low alpine vegetation zone, more or less above tree level at 900 to 1100 meters above, above sea level. This alpine summer farming has created unique cultural landscapes. So the biodiversity connected to cultural landscapes in Norway. What is biodiversity? Biodiversity is the diversity of ecosystems, species, and the genetic variations within species, and the ecological connections between these components. And on the Norwegian Red List, 29% of all threatened species in Norway are associated with cultural landscapes. It's a very high biodiversity in semi-natural grasslands in Norway. It can be up to 80 vascular plants per square meter. It is not only plants, it's many kind of insects, bryophytes, fungi, it is soil fauna, it's birds and it's mammals. What challenges do the plants meet in pastures? Well, removal of biomass, of course, defoliation, decreased nutrients, <laughs> trampling, the position of urine and feces, increased light conditions and changing microclimate. And uh, in the plant ecology, we talk about plant strategies. Uh, there are mainly three different strategies that plants have 
either they are competition competitors, either they, they are stress tolerant, or they are rudimentals, or they are, are something. Uh, a combination of these three strategies. And the plants that live in the grasslands, they are stress tolerant and ruderals mostly. They need to cope with stress, light open, and as I also will say later, um, uh, uh, that the ecosystems uh, are poor of nitrogen and phosphor, so it's a kind of nutrition stress. And they need to cope with the trampling from animals. That is the ruderal strategy. <laughs> Ecological processes in grasslands, it's less light competition because the few strong competitive species, they fail to exclude other species. It is less root competition because the lack of many trees, which suppress vascular plants with root competition and litter, um, yeah, are lacking. <laughs> we also have this phenomena called uh, mycorrhiza. What is mycorrhiza? That is uh, a symbiosis between plants and fungi. Uh, it's common in nutrient poor grasslands. And it's very important to secure to secure plant nutrient uptake, the coexistence and the maintain, maintenance of perennial forbs. Uh, nitrogen and phosphor enrichment of grasslands have especially especially the detrimental effects on species in some symbiosis with mycorrhiza and the low canopy. So to fertilize the grasslands, it's uh, uh, not good uh, for this symbiosis. It will uh, be very bad for the fungi. Um, then we have decrease of living and dead biomass. Grazing and mowing decreased the amount of litter as well as of living biomass. And decrease of litter favors living shoots and small plants. Litter is also negative for seedling establishment. And it has been found in the re research that species riches is found at low to intermediate levels of plant biomass. Then we come to increased recruitment and dispersal. Uh, it's uh, many plants in the grasslands that are um, they have this dispersion strategy to be spread uh, either with the, to connect their um, seeds to the fur of the animals or to be eaten and uh, come out again in the dung. So that is what we call epi and endosocorial dispersal via grazing animals. And grazing increased the availability of gaps allowing plant establishment and creates bare soil patches suitable for seed germination and establishment. And uh, this we have also uh, investigated in a project and uh, my last uh, slide is some reports uh, among them from a study that we made which concluded the importance of grazing animals in the role of dispersed uh, to, to, to disperse seeds from the plants in the, in the outfields. And we have now heard uh, about the, the evolution of these plants and the history, the millions of years of history. Uh, these plants has had a co-evolution with grazers. 
And the European flora was probably adapted to large herbivores, or they were adapted uh, to large herbivores. Cattle, horses, and sheep are descendants of native Eurasian herbivores, which now are extinct. And many species are adapted to live in grasslands. Well, I also mentioned this intermediate disturbance uh, hypothesis, which says that moderate, moderate disturbance is expected to increase species richness, and the traditional grazing practices are often considered as factors causing intermediate disturbance. Very important is this point, the decreased nutrients. The majority of organisms have adapted to nutrient poor habitats, which is most common in Central and uh, Northern Europe. Fertilization should decrease plant species richness because only a few have evolved in nutrient rich environments. And competitors are strongest in nutrient rich environments. Grazing in itself leads to limitation of several nutrients, nitrogen and phosphor for all the plant species, which make a cool existence between plants with different strategies possible. So, next point is increased spatial heterogeneity. Spatial variation in grazing, intensity of different vegetation, vegetation types. The grazing creates mosaics of microhabitats in the vegetation. Heavily grazed patches alternate with less grazed patches. It's trampling, it decreases the position. And there's also temporal changes in grazing preferences, which may further promote coexistence. All plant species. And uh, in Nibiu, we have had um, uh, several uh, projects where we have been investigated uh, uh, animals in the outfields, both sheep and uh, cattle. And uh, we use GPS colors to investigate the grazing patterns, the grazing preferences, and the animal behavior in alpine rangelands. Uh, the, effect, the effects of grazing, or yeah, mowing, I could pass that, now, on plant diversity are dependent on the evolutionary history, as we have heard. Also, the productivity and the pH of bedrock and soils. Time and time intervals between every grazing event. Annual grazing behavior. Sheep has another behavior as uh, 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 if you compare to cattle or to goats. And they graze differently. And of course, grazing intensity also affects the plant diversity. And then the area available for the grazing herds. To conclude, similar grasslands are very complex ecosystems. And coexistence and high biodiversity are explained by many ecological processes, which I now try to, to, uh, to go through. And where the extensive human factors interact with biotic as well as abiotic factors. And uh, this last point is very important. Resource limitation, reduced nitrogen and phosphor is a key factor to maintain the high biodiversity and the coexistence between plant species in seminatal grasslands. So to fertilize outfields, rangelands, it's not a good idea if you want to uh, preserve biodiversity. So 
Uh, now I come to say some words about uh, carbon sequestration in vegetation and soils in alpine rangelands in Norway. Uh, we have recently done a literature study and we have found out that it's, a, it's very few studies uh, made in the outfields, made in the rangelands. We have little knowledge. Uh, but the literature studies um, has uh, says we conclude that uh, grazing can be positive for carbon sequestration. It can be uh, also in alpine rangelands, but it's very hard to make general generalizations because uh, carbon sequestration is very site specific. Carbon sequestration is dependent on grazing pressure and the plant species on a site, the plant species composition, and also the microbial life in the soil, which is probably very important. That includes also the mycorrhiza. Uh, uh, one study we have found which we think is quite interesting and we want to, uh, I wanted to show it for you. Uh, it was made by Sørensen et al. in uh, 2008. She, she had this uh, paper written in 2018. It was a study made in Dovre at 1100 meters above sea level. Uh, her study studied uh, in the two seasons two 2014 and 2015. Uh, it was a study on both of the three types of vegetation, heathland, which are dominated by, by heath, uh, meadow, that is uh, grass and uh, herb dominated areas, and uh, shrubland, which was dominated by salix species. She measured uh, uh, carbon dioxide emission, carbon sequestration, and also carbon in the soil profile. And it, it is this uh, last uh, carbon sequestration in the, in the soil, which we found very interesting. Uh, as you can see here, it is much more stored in the vegetation dominated by grass and herbs than in the, domination, in the vegetation dominated by heath and shrub. And in the projects that we have now, we will um, we co cooperate with um, uh, NMBU in the Syskow. They have a project called Syskow and they will uh, take a lot of soil samples from outfields in Norway and we will supplement uh, with soil samples from areas which we are investigated in another project called Fjellbeite in Norwegian. And hopefully in some years uh, we will have more knowledge about this. What we also want to study more is the albedo effect in alpine rangelands. We have uh, included that in the Fjellbeite project. And uh, you also mentioned the albedo. Uh, it's a measure of the reflection from a surface. Uh, it's uh, a scale between zero and one. And uh, if it is a flat surface covered with snow, it has a very high albedo, 0 0.9. If it is new asphalt, <laughs> it's the opposite, <laughs> has a very low albedo, 0 0.05. Uh, light surfaces uh, gives high albedo, and which again uh, gives lower temperature. Dark surfaces absorb solar energy which gives low albedo and higher temperature. And uh, high vegetation as woodland absorbs more energy 
gives earlier snow melting than light surfaces and uh, with, without trees. And uh, we did a literature study here as well. And it's uh, good evidence in the literature that the albedo effect is dominant in mountain areas with snow cover in the winter time. And it is important to include the albedo effect in climate calculations of land use in, in Norway, where we have such areas in the mountains which are covered with snow every year. Put it back to the alpine summer farming, the landscape I showed in the first one of the first slides. What has happened there? Uh, earlier, it was of special importance for alpine summer farms to use the the woodland in uh, firewood and as material in their product in various productions. Um, and in 1850, we had 70,000 summer farms. And the upper tree limit was depressed three, 400 meter. Um, this in Norway, uh, the tree line is made by mountain birch, uh, the mountain birch. And today we only have 800 summer farms left that produce milk, which are you know, active summer farms producing milk. And we see, of course, that the tree limit is increasing again. We don't use the mountain birch very much as uh, uh, firewood or as uh, to heat uh, the trees uh, making uh, cattle. On the summer farms, we don't do that here. We, 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 some do, but uh, most of the milk is delivered directly to the dairies, dairy company, Tina. Uh, and as you see, this decline in summer farms has gone on the last hundred years. Uh, we really don't have much left, and the tree limit is increasing again. It's a lot of mountain birch now coming back in the mountains. That is bad for biodiversity, um, but it is also bad for for the um, quality of the grasslands. It reduces the quality of grasslands as grazing resources. Uh, we have this opinion that uh, in Norway, agriculture in the mountain areas can increase self-sufficiency and food security without compromising the environment. Uh, why do we say that? Uh, as you see, the map on the uh, left, uh, made of my colleague uh, Ulrika Bayer. Uh, here we have focused on the um, on the. Um, mountain communities or mountain um, regions regions yes municipalities uh, and uh, most of the mountain municipalities has had a decline in number of grazing animals on rangelands the last decade uh, yeah <laughs> sorry that was the, the the map to the right the map to the left is about infields. Large areas are no longer in agricultural use. Uh, that is uh, mostly areas which uh, earlier was used uh, to make um, feed for animal for husbandry, because many many farmers have changed and uh, uh, their production and uh, are not having husbandry any longer. And the map to the right uh, shows that most of the mountain municipalities has had a decline in number of grazing animals on rangelands the last decades. And as we heard also here in the beginning, 35% uh, of Norway has good grazing resources and only a third of the capacity is used. Uh, 
And my last slide. Uh, uh, much of what I have uh, been uh, talking about here um, about the biodiversity the projects we have had is uh, we have some some Nibio reports here that um, may be interesting for you to read more in. So I will. Uh,